Hello and welcome back. This is Kai. Can you say hello? Mm. No, not yet. Um, this is uh, the topic 4.3. Third sushi. Sushi. This is a topic about sushi. Um, mm -hmm. Topic 4.3 in our unit on water. And and that kind of fish is salmon. Good. This is salmon right there. We're from uh, the northwest, so we should know what salmon is. Although this is a bit uh, bright, so this is probably a farmed salmon, which we'll learn a little bit about uh, in this unit. I'm guilty of eating sometimes as well. Um, now, aquatic food production systems, that's what this unit's all about, is the food that we're uh, getting out of the oceans and out of the uh, rivers and streams and all those places. So have a look at the big ideas here, that's what we're after, and we'll dive right in. Um, for those in my class watching this video, I'm gonna ask that you push pause right now, read these questions and spend about 15 minutes trying to dig into this topic. Um, there's a seal there and there's some seal hunting boats in the background. Um, this occurs still in Canada. And depending on where you get your news source from, you might get one side of this argument or the other. Um, it is really important to learn about um, the destructive nature of seal hunting, especially at the commercial level. Uh, but it is also important to see that there is another side to this picture. Uh, I'll push play now. So if you're done researching, you might see the next. Uh, I think it should go. Let's see. Oh, yeah, there it goes. Um, so what's important to see here is that you can't really just say something is a practice is bad or it's good. In this case, uh, there's tradition and there's Inuit people that survive off of uh, seals and other wildlife. And but you can't say that they're destroying seal numbers or species counts because they're taking about 3% of the seals killed. The rest is going to commercial, the commercial industry, um, which is quite inhumane. Just have do some research and you'll see that. Um, the, the, they're threatening species numbers quite significantly. Uh, and they're taking the, the pelts, the fur, not the, the meat. So it's extremely wasteful as well. Canada has gone ahead and put some regulations in place. So you can only take so many per year, per person. So many boats can go out. There's a time you can't kill the young, trying to sort of regulate uh, what's going on with the amount of seals that are dying out there. The EU has also stepped in to say, we're not taking Canadian seal products anymore. Namibia has completely flipped it. Namibia used to be a seal hunting nation. Now they've said, let's bring in tourists to look at the seals. And they've made four times the amount of money doing that as they would have hunting and selling the seal pelts. Now, getting into aquatic ecosystems. What uh, are the sharks trying to do? Sharks are probably trying to eat some of those things. And what we see here is there's a lot of different layers in the ocean. Uh, you have your abyssopelagic down deep where it's very dark. You have your bathypelagic, your mesopelagic moving up and your epipelagic where most of uh, the life exists and all these zones are based off of the amount of light that's able to penetrate them. And then, and then the tribes might want to hide in, in the sand underwater and they'll come up and then bite you. Bite you. Uh oh, I hope they don't bite me on the toes. That could hurt, couldn't May, it? Because maybe that trap there is their house. That could be that house right at the bottom. But there's not actually a lot of life that lives down here in the abyssal. Uh, zone. Do you know why? why? Because it's dark. There's no light that goes down there. And so many things need light to survive because there's a layer of uh, light energy that feeds plants. And the plants feed the small things and the small things feed the bigger things. And if there's no light, there's no small plants. And actually, I think that's, well, perfect timing. Um, this is a marine trophic level. And what we see are the same thing, producers over here on the left, producers, which are the plants-based things that uh, do photosynthesis, generally. Um, then there's primary consumers, which we call zooplankton, uh, zoo for animal, and phyto for light. So phytoplankton, zooplankton. And then we have the secondary consumers up a bit higher, uh, and then the tertiary consumers at the end. And those are the sharks and the big, huge tuna um, and the salmon and things like that. If you look at this on both sideways, how would that be the same shape? Oh yeah, if you spun it around, it would still be a pyramid. That's why it's called a food or an energy pyramid. Pretty cool. Now, 
looking at uh, productivity in the oceans, by far the surface water is the most productive. Productive means there's a lot of life and a lot of things eating each other and a lot of different types of things swimming up here at the surface. So thermocline is the area just below the epipelagic zone where the temperature drops very, very quickly down into the me mesopelagic zone. Um, and the drop is rapid, and once it drops down to close to freezing, it stays cold the whole way down into the abyss. Um, interesting things about the epipelagic zone, I, sorry, above the thermocline is you have this layer of warm water that's influenced mostly by wind and, and sunlight and, and the air temperature. Uh, and people studying hurricanes can predict how strong hurricanes may be by how deep that epipelagic zone is, uh, or how close the thermocline is to the, to the surface. Um, now going into some of these questions, um, uh, long-lasting thermoclines are bad for productivity because they block the movement and the mixing between the most productive area, the epipelagic zones, and the deeper uh, layers where there's actually a lot of nutrient that can actually mix up and support life uh, in the epipelagic zone and vice versa. Um, interesting with winter and actually cold weather, something to think about is the thermocline sometimes are even non-existent in the polar, polar regions because the surface temperature is so cold anyway. Um, so let's see other questions. Why are coastal waters more productive? Um, more light feeds more plants, feeds more life and that temperature can sustain a lot of that life in the plants and other plants in it. Oh, should we make a video about Apollo 13? Definitely, we should do that one day. We watched that yesterday, that was a good movie. Mm -hmm. um, and the spaceship broke that they were inside with three people and then they needed to go in the moon lander. Yeah, and you know where they practice? They practice in water. We have different zones in uh, aquatic ecosystems, and some of these zones are dealing with uh, life, so where life can or cannot exist. Um, once you get into open water and you start getting deeper in open water, it's it's life then goes away the, pretty quickly. No, then all of the colors of the rainbow is there's a rainbow disappear. Good, you remember that, that's cool, yeah. I went scuba diving once with a red shirt and went down to about 125 feet and my shirt turned purple, purple, dark purple, dark, and then black. So all the colors disappear the deeper you go because sunlight can't penetrate that deep. And if sunlight can't penetrate that deep, plants like in this picture can't grow. You see four different groups of plants here. You see some plants growing completely underwater, submerged plants. Some plants learn how to float even on top of the water. There's some really interesting plants out there that have adapted to floating um, and filtering with their roots. I'm thinking water hyacinth, for example. That's an interesting one, it's an invasive species. It's also a very efficient plant. Um, emerged plants that start in the water then grow out and terrestrial plants, a lot of things but to look at on this graph. actually get too much water. Yeah, they get too much, so they have to figure out how to deal with it. Like mangroves, they get salt water. That's another interesting one we can dig into. Let's keep on moving and we're looking at um, some of the food that we're actually pulling out of the oceans for human consumption. Um, three different, Sushi. yeah, three different layers here that we're going to look at. We're going to look at algae, fish, and then shellfish slash other. That's just a lot of different things fall into that last category. So let's get going. Algae. What do you see? Ice cream. Oh, ice cream. Mint chocolate chip. Is that your favorite flavor? Yeah. Yeah, mine too. Cool. I like father, I like some. Um, we use algae, here's a weird one, Kai, we use algae as a food stabilizer. Um, it actually helps to thicken things like ice cream, and it ha helps to make ice cream even smooth. Isn't that weird? Sometimes they use algae from the ocean to do that. Lots of different uses for algae. Um, you might be a bit surprised by some of those things you see. Um, fish, looking at fish, fish is, the industry has uh, boomed over the last 40 50 years it's just really come up as people have become more used to eating fish it wasn't always that acceptable for everybody in the world to be eating fish um it was marketed quite well the healthy thing right the healthy meat alternative um and 
then we learned how to farm and take advantage of, of growing fish in bulk and getting it out there. Plus, most of the people around the world live on the coastal, on these coastal regions, so have access to a lot of fish. Um, so yeah, it's an industry that keeps growing and growing and growing. You can touch it, but it's not going to do anything. There you go. <laughs> Here's a question. I'll leave it on pause for a second. See if you can figure out an answer to this question. Say 2.2%. 2.2%. How did you know that? This is like five years old and he could figure that answer no, out. No, my dad told me that. Sorry, I'm helping you out as always, aren't you? Aren't I? Okay. Um, and looking at shellfish, a lot of different uh, things are included in the category of shellfish. Um, Why is the arrow's purple letter sideways? Sideways, because I just thought that'd look kind of neat if we did it sideways rather than on top this time. Does that work for you? Yeah, yeah me too. Okay. It's very funny. So lots of different things. This is kind of the other category that we look at. Um, there's a lot of a lot that fit in here that also we have some ethical concerns with as well. Um, and also some things in here that are very cultural. So some cultures use them, other cultures do not want to have anything to do with some of these things. Um, like eating turtle. Would you eat turtle? No. Mm, that's kind of strange for us to go turtle. Would you eat frogs? No. No, no but some people love to eat frogs, right? Uh, I have friends who enjoy eating frog legs. So some interesting things on this list. Um, that come up that we could talk about in ESS in terms of different culture, different environmental value systems. Uh, all right. So why might aquatic food systems be less efficient than terrestrial? In other words, land food systems like a farm? Um, let's have a think about some of these. So I'm going to ask you some questions and see if you know the answer. Where do plants get their energy from? Do you know? Sun. Hey, all right. Um, and is there more sun on the land or more sun in the ocean deep down? More sun on the land. That's the answer right there. Good. And wh where do we tend to eat from the food chain? Do we eat at the top of the food chain? So do we eat the big animals uh, like cows or do we eat vegetables? Vegetables. Well, we do in our family. We eat a lot of vegetables, um, but not everyone out there. But regarding the food chains in the ocean, we tend to go right to that top of that food chain. We eat tuna and salmon and those kind of fish. And those are right at the top of the food chain in the oceans. However, on land, we're not always going to the top uh, order consumers out there. So we tend to impact the ocean food systems. If you're eating uh, these high order consumers, you're affecting everything down below them pretty heavily then. So Can put I the links in there video? and then, yeah, we'll watch this after. And this is about sustainable food. And, it, and you it, might want to watch the video of this. You might want to, because you know what you might learn? What? If the food that you're eating is sustainable or not. And you might be shocked. And keep in mind, this is uh, an American talking about an American situation. Um, it's different everywhere we are in the world. Each country, each state in the U.S. Um, has a different, slight different list. And it shifts depending on where you are. That tags into... Uh, sustainability. They say, think globally, eat locally. And if we can do that, we, we're doing a lot better uh, job. So I shouldn't be eating fish from Norway, per se, that came from a fish farm, or blueberries from Chile or something like that. Um, if I could do that locally, we'd be doing better as a planet. And with that message, I think that's probably where we end right now. Next class, we'll have a, a blog. I'll can put it up there, a blog post on um, ethical Seesaw. food. Seesaw! Seesaw. Yeah, that's what you use for your class. We use Google and other things like that, too. Do you want to say goodbye to everyone? Bye. See you later. Thanks, Kai. <gasps> what are you, sticking your tongue out to the world? Are you sticking your tongue out to the world? <laughs> See ya. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Chump. <laughs> okay.